My name is Rebecca Nickel. I'm a technical application scientist at BioLegend. And um, I received my PhD in immunology at the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University, where I studied the effect of uh, low zone signal cytokine signaling environments and uh, ex vivo stabilization of human T Rex. Um, I would like to welcome you all to BioLegend's workshop on the cutting edge technology for deep characterization of viral and self antigen peptide induced cellular immune responses. So to give you an idea of what to expect for this workshop today, I'd like to go over just the general overview. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the aim of the project. Uh, then we'll go into the experimental design, some of the cellular and molecular tools that we use to characterize or to utilize, that we use utilized in these experiments. And then we'll go into the results and conclusions from there. So over the last 100 plus years, we've had great advancements in immunology, and this has helped us to better characterize immune responses against uh, multiple injuries and pathologies. Um, and now as we're advancing research further, um, we're having more questions arise and we need more multimodal and multiomic approaches um, that are critical to understand these biological processes as a whole. So synchronized approaches aimed at um, deeply characterizing cellular phenotype, cytokine profiles, RNA expression, and transcription and signaling are um, going to be very helpful in allowing us to have a total view of how the immune, how, of how the immune system is responding um, differently in various antigenic challenges. So thanks to the great team at BioLegend, we have a whole suite of reagents and applications that allow you to go into a um, complete in-depth analysis um, of these immune responses. So to provide an example of how this may done, may be done, um, we aimed to stimulate T cells with various viral neoantigen and self-peptides. Then we aim to characterize those cellular responses through cellular phenotyping with flow cytometry, um, looking at cytokine profiles with Legimplex. Uh, then we wanted to look at simultaneous RNA and protein expression with our TotalSeq platform. And then lastly, we can look at transcription factors and signaling with Western blot and some of our phospho pairs. Um, in total, this gives us a complete visualization of cellular and molecular um, impacts on cells and how those can be affected um, with various antigen-specific peptides. So to complete this work, we first needed to work out the T cell stimula stimulation side of the protocol. Um, we used this STAR protocol by Bosgus and others that was published this past year. Um, and in this protocol, they are just uh, showing how you can expand uh, peptide-specific T cells and then characterize them. So we modified it a little bit to fit our experiments. Um, but what we did is take a double SARS-CoV-2 vaccinated donor. Uh, this donor was not, um, did not have their booster shot. We isolated these PBMCs and then we stimulated them with GMCSF, IL-4, and FLT3 ligand to um, induce APC differentiation. And then on the second day, we um, added in LPS, R848, and IL-1 beta, along with our peptide pools. So all of these peptide pools are, uh, are have, <laughs> sorry, all the peptide pools are 15 MERS, and our four main groups were the spike of the wild type variant, the spike of the delta variant of SARS-CoV-2, and then myelin basic protein, which is a self protein that uh, is implicated in multiple sclerosis, and then uh, the peptide melanA or MART1, which is considered a neoantigen, and then we used a no peptide control. So um, in these, uh, from day two to day nine, we passage the supernatants uh, every one or two days with fresh ex vivo 15, uh, IL-2, IL-7, and IL-15. And then on day nine, or sorry, on day 10, we ended up doing five-hour peptide restimulations that were in the presence of anti-CD28 and anti-CD49D. And these five-hour peptide restimulations were prior to doing the flow staining, total seek staining, or cell lysis for Western blot. In the case of looking at soluble analytes with Legimplex, we did either 24-hour or 48-hour peptide re-stimulations, and again, that's in the presence of anti-CD28 and anti-CD49D. 
So before we get into the results, I would just like to go over what we used as our flow panel and just make you all familiar with the Legend Plex workflow. So the flow panel that we used was a 17 color panel. We analyzed it on the five laser SciTech Aurora spectral cytometer. And as you can see, we used both surface markers as well as intracellular markers. So we used our Cytofast fixed perm buffer set um, to catalyze that staining. <clears throat> and for the sake of time, I won't be covering all of this data, but if you have any interest in some of these markers and would like to talk to me about it after, you're more than welcome to. Um, so Legendplex allows us to analyze up to 14 soluble analytes at one time in an experiment. And the workflow looks like uh, where you would take your sample, whether that is serum or cell culture supernatant, and incubate, incubate that with beads that are coated with antibodies for a specific soluble analyte. Uh, so these, this could be a bead specific for IL-2, this could be a bead specific for interferon, interferon gamma, and so on and so forth. After, one, after a one hour incubation, you would incubate this resulting sample with a biotinylated detection antibody that is also specific for that specific uh, analyte. And then we do an incubation with a streptavidin PT, PE so that we can visualize the amount of soluble analyte that is in that sample. After the protocol is done, which usually takes about three or four hours, you can analyze the data with flow cytometry um, or collect the data with flow cytometry and then bring that data into our free cloud-based cloud Legendplex software where you will get plots of standard curves for each analyte that you can then plot your sample against that and convert this PE signal into a uh, predicted concentration of that analyte in your sample. So now we'll move on to the results, starting out with some cell surface phenotyping, and then we'll also look at some of the Legendplex data um, that correlates with that data. So first we looked at CD4 T cells, and um, we wanted to look at CD25 expression on the x-axis here and CD127 expression on the y-axis. Um, and one of the things that we first found is that we saw with peptide with peptide stimulation, we got a great expansion of CD25 positive cells. So this included not only an expansion of the CD25 positive, CD127 negative Treg population with peptide stimulation, um, which is indicative of early immune response control, because this is, again, this is only a five hour stimulation. But we also saw an expansion of the CD25 positive, 127 positive effector T cell population as well. Interestingly, there was the lowest Treg expansion with self-antigens, which is great. It means they're having a good response to self-antigens that is not unregulated. Um, so that it means that there is higher regulation of effector responses against the self-antigens. Um, when we plot the ratio of the Tregs to the T effectors, we can see that there is a great contraction of the Treg to T effector ratio with viral peptides um, that is not as pronounced with self-peptides. Um, in looking at this data, you can see that there is a great expansion of CD25 expression on all of these peptide-induced cells. So when we plot that, uh, we can see that both viral and self-peptides have an increased per cell basis expression of CD25 among CD4s. Um, so in thinking about how um, the immune system can regulate the environment around it, uh, a way that some of the cells will do that is they'll shed the CD25 into the supernatant to control an IL-2 response. So with flow, we can't directly look at soluble versions of CD25, but with Legendplex, we can. So what we did is look at um, two time points, 24 hours and 48 hours, and we measured the level of soluble CD25 in those supernatants. And what we found is that the viral peptide-induced um, cultures had a significant increase in soluble CD25 shedding uh, compared to the uh, self-peptide-induced cultures. So even though both cultures are showing increased expression of CD25 on their surface, only the viral peptide-induced cultures are showing a high level of shedding that is occurring. And when this makes sense, because when you think about, um, or when you see some of the papers that are coming out about COVID-19, 
there is a correlation between the level of soluble CD25 in the serum of patients with severe COVID-19 disease um, and that being correlated with worsened disease. So this makes sense because soluble CD25 is trying to control that IL-2 response um, and in some of these patients with severe COVID-19 they have just unregulated cytokine storm so it's a regulatory response that the body is just trying to keep up with that going on. Um, so in thinking about regulation, we can see that soluble CD25 is regulating IL-2. Well, what about other markers of regulation such as CTLA-4 and PD-1? So we looked at CTLA-4, and as you can see, we have CD4 T cells on the top here and CD8 T cells on the bottom. The CD4s are shown graphically here on the left, and the CD8s are shown on the right. Um, and as you can see in the spike um, or in the viral, in viral peptide induced groups, there's a massive increase in CTLA-4 expression. There is still an increase in CTLA-4 expression among the MVP and melan -A groups as well for the self-peptides, uh, but it's just not as much as that uh, viral peptide. Similarly to soluble CD25 and CTLA-4, we also are seeing an increase in PD-1 expression among these viral peptide-induced um, cultures. And again, uh, you, seem a you see a very similar pattern with PD-1 expression as you did with uh, the CTLA-4 and soluble CD25. So in thinking about this, um, if we're seeing a very high regulatory response in viral peptide-induced cultures, we would assume that this is in response to a very high inflammatory response that is occurring. So then we want to look at, okay, well, is there increased uh, inflammatory cytokines in those cultures that is causing this regulation to be so highly upregulated? So in order to see cytokines, we can do that two different ways. So we can look at intracellular protein characterization with intracellular staining with flow. Or we can look at this um, soluble analyte characterization of the culture supernatants with Legendplex. So first we looked at IL-17A, and we found a pretty interesting trend where only the delta spike is having this massive increase in um, IL-17A producing CD4s. So once we saw that on flow cytometry, we wanted to look at Legendplex. And we used two separate panels for this. So these are pre-made panels that are available on the website for purchase. Um, and we looked at the human essential immune response panel as well as the human COVID-19 cytokine storm panel two. And as you can see, um, it correlates directly with the flow data in that the Delta spike group um, is showing the highest um, expression of IL-17A and not only in intracellular staining after five-hour peptide stimulation but also after a 24-hour um, peptide stimulation and build up in the supernatant with Legendplex. Uh, so then we wanted to look at some other inflammatory cytokines and what are the most popular ones? Well we can look at IL-2 shown here on the top row x-axis and in this first graph uh, interferon gamma showed on the y-axis and in the middle graph, and TNF-alpha shown along the x-axis on the bottom and in the far right graph. And as you can see, the viral peptide-induced cultures are showing the largest increase of not only IL-2, but also interferon gamma and also TNF-alpha. And that's just shown graphically here. Um, so then uh, we wanted to look at CD8s, and in CD8s it was very interesting because it was a completely different pattern. So in CD8s we actually saw that there wasn't as much of an increase in uh, interferon gamma and TNF-alpha with the viral peptides or with MVP, but in melan -A cultures there was a very significant increase of interferon gamma and TNF-alpha in those cultures. So. Right now we're looking at a snapshot of which cells are producing which cytokines, but with Legendplex we can actually see how much of those cytokines are being produced. So we looked at both 24 and 48 hours for IL-2 concentration, interferon gamma concentration, and TNF-alpha concentration. And similar to the flow data we saw before, we see very large increases in IL-2 production, interferon gamma production, and TNF-alpha production with viral peptide um, induction. However, when you look at the melan -A group for interferon gamma and for TNF-alpha, 
you can see that there's a large increase there as well. So there's a measurable cytokine response that's happening there. Um, this kind of points out the differences that are um, the advantages to both Legendplex and Flow, in that in Legendplex you can get a very uh, accurate read of the concentration of that cytokine in the supernatan, but it's not telling you which cells are making that if you have a culture that is made up of multiple cell populations. But with flow cytometry, it, will tell you, it won't tell you how much, but it will tell you which cells are coming from. So when you combine these two applications together, you can see that, okay, well, the interferon gamma and TNF alpha is being produced by CD4s and viral groups, but in the melanin A group, it's being produced by CD8 T cells. So not only are you getting a measure of how much of the cytokine is produced, but also where that cytokine is being produced. So here we're looking at the rest of the um, cytokines that we looked at with Legendplex and just wanted to show you kind of the overall trend. And you can see that there's a lot of inflammatory cytokines that are being induced with the viral peptide stimulation, but um, this is not reflected with the self-peptide stimulation. So this is just an idea of how much of the data that you can get from Legendplex. And again, this is two separate panels, uh, the human essential immune response panel and the human COVID-19 cytokine storm panel too. So in summary so far, uh, with our flow cytometry and Legendplex data, we found that Treg and T effector populations are expanding differently in response to viral versus self-peptide stimulation. These um, viral peptide-induced stimulations are polarizing our cells more towards a CD4 inflammatory response. The MVP is also polarizing our cells to more of a CD4 inflammatory response, but it is not as potent, um, which that's good. That means our donor has an appropriate response to antigenic challenge. And then the melanin A group, interestingly, polarized more to an, towards an inflammatory CD8 response, which is interesting because this is probably more of an indirect response, given that it's a 15 mer peptide, and due to classical peptide MHC loading, this should be more CD4, um, but it's just polarizing a little bit more towards CD8. And uh, when you think about inhibiting tumor genesis, this makes sense, right? So if you have a mutated self protein that's popping up and may be promoting um, tumor genesis, this would be a great response to induce fever, inflammation, stimulate macrophage phagocytosis and angiogen presentation, and ultimately inhibit tumor genesis. So most of the characterization shown thus far has been pretty, is, is common in what we do today in the immunological research world. Uh, so how can we take it a step further and go beyond what is being done very commonly? So naturally the next step is to look at more proteins and look at um, how those proteins are also being expressed in correlation with the RNA. So this is exactly what total seq reagents combined with single cell RNA seq allow, allows us to do with the application site seq. So site seq is a relatively new application that allows for the simultaneous detection of single cell proteins and RNA. This is accomplished by utilizing oligonucleotide labeled total seq antibodies to integrate cellular protein and transcriptome measurements into an efficient single cell readout. So here is the total, uh, total, the total site seq workflow. Uh, you can see that there is very similar staining to flow where you prepare your cell, cell suspension, stain with total seq antibodies, and then partition them and go through the whole single cell workflow. Um, for the experiments that I did, um, I did the regular 10-day culture, as I showed earlier, did the five-hour peptide stimulation in the presence of anti-CD28 and anti-CD49D. Then I enriched for live cells using the dead cell removal kit. And just to give a little plug for one of my colleagues, she's doing an in-booth presentation at 3.15 um, on this dead cell removal kit. It's brand new and it works great. Uh, so after the dead cell removal kit, we did the total seek antibody staining, then go through the single cell, single cell workflow of gen generation, ADT and cDNA library prep, then sequencing and data analysis and presentation. So I used uh, our, our multi-omics analysis software called MAS. It is available on our website. Um, and we created these dimensionality reduction UMAPs 
where these cell populations are gated based on the ADT reads that you're getting, so cell surface protein. And we found some interesting things just looking at these general UMAPs where you can see an expansion of the CD4 positive Th1 T cells. I'm sorry that these labels are pretty small, but <laughs> that is, that's what those are. Um, so we also saw a shift from primarily naive and resting cell populations um, to more of a factor and memory T cell populations. Interestingly, you can see here in the tan and orange, which is the effector memory and central memory, there is an expansion with the viral stimulated um, cultures versus self-peptides are not quite as potent and obviously the no peptide is very small. And lastly, in the green, we can also see an expansion of memory T-Rex that is happening with peptide stimulation. Another way to visualize these populations is in a bar plot like this. So here in the red colors, we have CD4 positive central memory and effector memory T-cells. And as you can see, the no-peptide and self-peptide groups, the, these populations remain pretty consistent. But with viral stimulation, you can see there's a great expansion of the uh, effector memory and central memory cells. Additionally, you can see a contraction of this naive T cell population that is occurring with the viral peptide stimulation as well. Moving on to T regs, we can see an expansion of memory T regs here in the gold color for all the peptide stimulated groups and a contraction of this naive T reg population that is almost non existent in the other groups. Lastly, we can look at the CD8 responses where CD8, naive CD8 T cells would be this population here in the green that is contracting with peptide stimulation and the effector memory and central memory CD8s are expanding um, the most in that melanin A group which is where we saw that CD8 polarization in our earlier flow cytometry and legendplex data. So from the cell populations established with the gating in um, MAS, we ran differential expression analyses um, of both the ADT or protein expression and RNA expression where we compared the peptide stimulated groups to the no control peptide. So the red colors here are indicating an increase in expression of that marker compared to the no control and the dark blue would in indicate a decrease in expression compared to the uh, no peptide control. So here we're looking at the memory Treg population. So we're not looking at the full culture, we're just specifically looking at memory Tregs. And you can see that there's very unique molecular signatures that are popping up that differ between the viral peptides and the self-peptides. And as you can see, some of that is occurring with the mitochondrial um, RNAs, where they are decreased with the viral stimulation and increased with self-peptide stimulation. And then the op opposing is happening with some of these markers down here. If we want to look at some individual markers specifically, we can start with CD38, which is an activation marker, and in Tregs has sh been shown to be indicative of a more suppressive Treg. And interestingly, that's increased among this MVP or self-peptide group. Uh, so CD86 is kind of interesting um, because I didn't know that Tregs expressed CD86 until I was looking at this data and I started looking at some other papers and there was some single cell data that came out a few years ago that was indicating that Tregs are actually expressing CD86 as a um, early activation marker and they're using it to control effector T cell responses um, early on in that immune response. So that kind of theme is kind of fitting with our flow data that we saw. CD39 is another activation marker indicative of suppressive and stable, pheno uh, stable phenotype for Tregs. MKI67 is the RNA for KI67, which many of us use for a cellular proliferation marker. And that's, again, increased across all the groups, but the most so among the MVP for Tregs. And then lastly, I just want to point out the CD25, because this kind of caught me off guard a little bit, and I had to think about it a little bit, of why CD25 would be decreasing on Tregs if they're becoming activated and more stable. Um, and we also have to take into account that that no peptide group is primarily made up of a lot less cells 
but also the cells that are there are more natural Tregs that are known to express the highest levels of CD25. So this is kind of um, an artificial thing that you just need to take into account the population that you're looking at. <coughs> But this, uh, this trend of CD25 and IL-2-RA, RNA, um, they look very similar across the two. So then we can look at the CD4 effector T cells. And again, we're seeing very unique molecular signatures that are coming through. So here we're seeing an increase in all of these markers among the um, virally induced cultures whereas there is no change or a decrease in these markers among self-peptides. And then for the RNA expression, we're seeing a decrease in these ribosomal proteins with viral peptide stimulation and an increase in these markers with uh, self-peptide stimulation. Again, looking at some of the markers individually, we're seeing a decrease in CD45RA and an increase in CD45RO, which is, is as expected, where we would get more memory T cells um, in the cultures with peptide stimulation. We're also looking at these activation markers, um, CD86, CD25, CD38, CD39, which I think is very interesting because this data is pretty much completely opposite of the Tregs, right? So um, in effector T cells that are stimulated with viral peptides, you're getting increased activation of these activation markers, whereas in the self-peptide groups, there's little to no change among CD4 effectors. Um, but in the Treg data, we were actually seeing the complete opposite, where the Tregs were actually showing increased expression of these markers and down, um, decreased expression of these markers um, among viral-induced stimulations. And lastly, uh, I just want to show that the data is there, but um, the CD8 data is an indirect effect, right, because these peptides are primarily CD4 polarizing. So just to show that you can get some of this data from the CD8 groups where you're seeing with delta spike, you're seeing an increase in some of these activation markers more so with CD8s. Um, and again, that melan A group there is showing some increased activation of CD8s there as well. Uh, so this is just an idea of some of the data and some of the power that you can get. But you can also go and do much deeper sequencing than this and get even more meaningful data from that. So now we've characterized our cells with flow cytometry, doing cellular phenotyping, looking at cytokine analysis with legend plex, and then also looking at simultaneous protein and RNA detection with our TotalSeq platform. So now, um, from the TotalSeq data, we found some interesting things and we wanted to see, okay, can we see activation of signaling pathways? So that's where we used some of our uh, Western blot phospho pairs. And uh, one of the markers that we found was interesting was um, STAT3 because STAT3 is phosphorylated with JAK-STAT and MAP-K activation, um, specifically with interferon, EGF, IL-5, and IL-6, which these were all increased um, according to the Legendplex data that we saw. However, when we looked at our total seq data and the differential expression analysis, we didn't see any change in STAT3. But remember, this is looking at an overall expression of pan-STAT3. Um, so we wanted to see, is there phosphorylated protein changes that are occurring with peptide stimulation? So our phospho uh, pairs allow us to look at both um, pan-STAT3 as well as phosphorylated STAT3 side by side. So these are separate blocks that are occurring. Um, and we're showing pan-STAT3 here on the left in the upper plot and then uh, phosphorylated STAT3 in this lower blot. And this is just shown graphically, um, normalized to that no peptide control group. And you can see there's very little changes in the pan STAT3, which is correlating with the total seq data that we saw. Um, but there's actually a very high level of phosphorylation that's occurring with peptide stimulation. So this was great. This is giving us a more deeper dive into some of the signaling um, activation that we're observing. So then, um, Again, looking at total seq data, we looked at the differential expression analysis, and this is of the total cell population. And you can see with, um, with peptide stimulation, there was an increase in PLK1 um, with each of these peptides. So we looked and said, okay, what is PLK1? PLK1 plays an important role in cell cycle progression in late G2 and early prophase. And it also has phosphatase activity 
in um, pathways including cyclin B, CDC2, and P10. And as a Treg immunologist, I saw P10 and I got really excited because I did a lot of work with that. And um, PLK1 phosphorylation stabilizes P10, and P10 acts to inhibit PI3K, which actually inhibits AKT mediated Fox FOXP3 destabilization. So if you were to have phosphorylation of PLK1, this may help polarize towards more of a Treg stabilizing environment. Um, so we wanted to see, okay, how is that acting in um, our peptide in our different peptide groups? And what we found was really interesting. Uh, so we have regular PLK1 here, pan PLK1, and phosphorylated PLK1 along the bottom. And we did see some changes in the PLK1 overall expression again, correlating with that total seq data. But we saw a very interesting pattern with the phosphorylated PLK1 in which specifically I want to point out this MVP group, which is an autoantigen essentially, um, that has a very, very high stable or very high phosphorylation of PLK1. And this may be part of what we're seeing, where we're seeing higher levels of Treg and less of a contract, sorry, less of a contraction of that Treg T effector ratio that we saw in the flow data at the very beginning. So in summary, uh, we detected differential expansion of the Treg and T effector populations that was distinct and unique given a viral versus a self-peptide stimulation. We also found, not surprisingly, that self-peptides drive a more suppressive and stable Treg phenotype. <clears throat> and then on a more broad level, we have shown that while single applications can provide very valuable information for your research, if you compound those applications, it actually fills in some of the gaps in your analysis and gives you a more total picture of what, is, what exactly is happening in those cultures. Altogether, multimodal cellular characterization with biologin applications allows for a more in-depth, all-encompassing evaluation of antigen-specific immune responses. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone at Biologin who has helped to make this project possible, especially our strategic marketing team, our proteogenomics, bioinformatics, molecular cell bio, and flow teams who have been very instrumental in helping me do all this research. It's been a great time.